Maybe we'll start. <laughs> so uh, it's a pleasure to have Rick uh, for his third and final lecture. As usual, if you have a question, unmute yourself or just put it in the chat and uh, make sure it's addressed to everyone. So take it away, Rick. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Ivan. Uh, so today I want to talk about the, this quite particular model, the five vertex model, and a generalization of that model called the, which we call the genus zero five vertex model. Uh, Hugo was talking about the six vertex model, uh, and ours is a special case of his. Uh, it's a special case which is significantly easier to analyze, and in fact, we'll get a sort of quite complete uh, uh, analysis, including some explicit limit shapes uh, and everything. Un unlike in his case, where making things rigorous is a real challenge. Here, it's really not very hard because everything is quite explicit, but it's still, uh, it, it kind of lies between the Dimer model, which is completely determinantal, uh, and the full six vertex model, which is very, still very hard and unsolved in general. Uh, so we're at some intermediate level of difficulty. But uh, so let's go ahead. Here's the five vertex model, uh, right? It's, it's a configurations on the square grid. Uh, configurations of paths on the square grid, which uh, have five different kind of local configurations, right? It just looks like the six vertex configurations, except I'm throwing out the, the possibility that two paths will touch, right? So they're in this lecture, they're gonna be north, east going lattice paths, like in the picture here. Uh, and uh, for Hugo, there was some symmetry in the weights. There was A, A, B, B, C, C, here we're going to take the sort of completely asymmetric case. So there's five different weights, although here you only see three parameters, X, Y, and R. And the reason is, uh, the reason we don't have, we don't need five variables is for one thing, for one thing, we can scale all the weights by a constant and it doesn't, has no effect on the probability. So I'm, I'm scaling the constant so that the first, the weight of an empty vertex is just one. And then the, then the second uh, savings is that the, if you're working on torus, for example, the, the, if you look at a path, the number of right turns and the number of left turns it makes uh, is always even. That is this, the same number of left turns and right turns. So there's no harm in setting the last two weights, the weight of a right turn and the weight of a left turn to be the same. So really there's th three parameters now uh, instead of five, but uh, it's still a the full full asymmetric five vertex model, and we're going to call the parameters e to the x for this configuration e to the y, and then r e to the x plus y over two, and r e to the x plus y over two for the last two. And what this means is that uh, well, each corner uh, gives us a weight r, but then the the capital X counts the number essentially the number of vertical uh, line segments in our configuration and y counts the number of horizontal line segments in our configuration. So for example, what, if you read at the bottom of the slide here, a configuration that has a probability, uh, some constant one over z times, well, then you have e to the vx plus hy times r to the c, where, where I should have said c is the number of corners, not r, sorry, and v is the number of vertical edges and H is the number of horizontal edges uh, in, the, in the picture here. And, and this is just a little simulation uh, here when I set X, X and Y to be zero and R to be one, uh, in which case it's just essentially the uniform measure uh, on all configurations with some toroid, toroidal boundary conditions. All right, uh, so what role do the parameters X and Y play? Well, they are gonna play the role of the X and Y, which I've been talking about in my previous lectures, they're like the, the vertical and hor horizontal and vertical uh, magnetic field. So if you increase X, uh, what's gonna happen is, the, is you're gonna increase the number of vertical lines. So the, these paths, which these monotone lattice paths, which go through the, the lattice are gonna tend to, they're gonna have a higher density, uh, higher horizontal density. Uh, and if I increase Y, they'll have a higher vertical density. Uh, the, 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 because those configurations will have a higher weight. On the other hand, the, the R dependence is the most interesting one uh, because that controls how, how much the paths like to turn a corner. OK, 
Okay, so let me see if I can get, okay, there we go. Uh, and I should mention that, you know, we've been talking about Lawson's tilings earlier in these lectures. Uh, Lawson's tilings is a special case of the five vertex model when you set R to be one. So if you uh, sort of ignore the extra weight per corner, uh, then you get ex in fact exactly the, the Lawson's tiling model. And you can kind of see that in this, in this simulation. If you look on the left, the, the paths formed by the blue and green chains are exactly, you know, northeast going lattice paths. If, if you sort of draw the lattice path right through the center of that chain of blue and green uh, lozenges, then you can map that onto the square grid so that these are non-intersecting lattice paths in the usual sense. And so, right, so and <laughs> either way you draw it, right, like, like a lozenge tiling or like this lattice path, I'm going to be drawing it like this lattice path, but it's really an equivalent model when r equals one. When r is not equal to one, uh, this, this gives an you can think of this as a, as a way to make uh, the, the blue and green lozenges inter interact. If R is bigger than one, then you get an extra weight when the blue and green are next to each other. And if R is less than one, you get, you, you know, they don't, like to, they, they don't like to be next to each other, if you like. So you have fewer corners. Okay, is that all right? Okay. Uh, here are some uh, simulations just to get a feel for this model, if you haven't seen it before. Uh, here's the R equals one case right in the middle again. And, and here, when you, when you make R large, here's R equals 10, right? And I guess in these simulations, I set X and Y to both be zero still, at least for, at least for this one here. Uh, uh, so, so all that happened, well, I mean, what happens is that the uh, paths like to turn corners because those, they get higher weight if they have more corners. And so you get this path with zigzag along. Uh, for a while, but uh, notice that the typical direction of a path uh, is still sort of in the one-one direction. That's due to the fact that x and y are the same. I mean, here the x and y are zero. I should have probably given you some simulations where x and y are different, but you'll just see the slope of the path and the density of the path uh, change. On the other hand, when r is less than one, uh, the paths don't like to have corners, so they tend to tend to go in a straight line for a while uh, and then turn occasionally. Just less frequently. <laughs> so like in the upper, in the upper simulation here on the right, uh, this is the uh, x, x, x and y are zero, r equals 0.1. But in the lower simulation, what I did was I increased x and y both. Uh, I think I forgot what, the, what value I chose, but x and y are so, somewhat larger. Uh, and what happens is that just, that just means that there's more paths in this in your torus. Uh, the, the typical configuration will have a higher density of paths, both, both horizontal density and vertical density, which leads to just a higher density of paths. And now you can kind of see something interesting going on, uh, which we don't understand. Uh, and we don't even know if it's a real ph phenomenon yet or not. But it looks like there's some, well, for, for one thing, certainly the paths tend to follow each other. If one path is going vertical, then the ones nearby also tend to be going vertical, vertically and similar similarly for the horizontal uh, paths. And whether this sort of large scale structure persists in some limit is a, still an open question about this model. Okay, those are just some simulations. And frankly, uh, uh, these, the first two simulations are you know, easy to do and they converge rapidly. The last simulation, right, is, is harder to do because uh, uh, the convergence is much slower. So you have to sort of take this simulation with a, with a little grain of salt. I didn't try to optimize, optimize it or give you some sort of a exact simulation. All right, well, um, the first question we ask as a statistical physicist here is how do you compute the free energy? Now, what is the free energy? It's just the, you know, the, or, or if you like the log of the partition function, on say an n by n torus. When you fix, fix the parameters x, y, and r, I should have put an r in here as well, but we're gonna fix r, and the interesting quantity for us is gonna be how f for a fixed r varies as a function of x and y. <clears throat> and of course, we know how to compute this when r equals one. It's just the Lawson's tiling free energy, which I, in fact, already talked about earlier in, the, in, in these lectures. 
But when r is not equal to one, we don't have this uh, determinantal uh, formula for the free energy or the partition function. So you know we have to fall back on the beta ansatz technique, which is uh, you know as we learned from Hugo's talk, somewhat complicated and fraught with with the uh, difficulties. Let's say, okay. But let me. What I want to do today, you know, even though it's somewhat notorious, notoriously difficult uh, thing, I want to sort of see how much I can get through in in just a few. I, I I took it as something of a challenge when I made. Well, this okay. So I've given this talk before, <laughs> but you know, it's a challenge to try to present at least the combinatorial part of the beta ansatz. Uh, in a few slides, and, and so I'm going to see, you can tell me afterwards if I succeeded or not. So I don't want to be too technical, but uh, but there's some quite beautiful parts to it. So let's just go ahead. What is the beta ansatz? Well, what I'm going to do is uh, put the model on a cylinder, uh, just like, well, I guess uh, Hugo did put it on a torus, but let's think about a torus, uh, sort of an infinitely, uh, infinitely tall cylinder of circumference capital N. Right, and here's one row of that cylinder. So we should really glue the right endpoint to the left endpoint to make a cycle here. And then we have a set of paths running, running on this cylinder, northeast lattice paths on this cylinder running, running from below to above and, and occasionally turning to the right. And uh, there's a, a transfer matrix T uh, associated to this uh, <coughs> cylinder, which, which uh, tells you the, the, how to get from a given configuration on one row, and by configuration on one row, I mean which, which of the vertical edges are, are occupied. Like in this, on this row, it's one, five, and six. Uh, on the next row, it's three, five, and seven. And so the entry in the matrix is a, is a uh, uh, subset of the N, of the capital N uh, uh, vertical edges on this row. Uh, right, that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the indexing set for the matrix. And if I take two subsets, I get a weight, which is going to be zero if they're not interlaced, weakly interlaced. But if they are interlaced, like in the figure here, then you get a certain weight. And in this case, the weight is r to the fourth, because there's four corners, one, two, three, four. And then there's uh, e to the three, oh, that should be a capital X. X is the, that's because there's three particles here. I get three new vertical lines, if you like. And then there, I also get three horizontal lines. Well, that, that's, that's where I get the three capital Y here. All right. That is the entry in the matrix. So it's just a simple sort of matrix with, pol with entries, which are just monomials in R and uh, E to the X and E to the Y. And of course, uh, as has been discussed already, if I take a certain power of this matrix, like T to the K, T to the K, a, B is the total weight of configurations which start in a certain state A on the bottom row and K rows higher up will end in state B. So that's the matrix entry and the, and the free energy which we're trying to calculate is then, here I wrote it, an explicit dependence on R uh, and X and Y is determined from the leading eigenvalue of this matrix T, right? You have to, it's a, it's a Perron Frobenius matrix uh, you know, non-negative integer matrix, uh, and it has a unique uh, positive eigenvector and a, you, you know, the corresponding eigenvalue, the Perron Frobenius eigenvalue, that's the one we care about. And if that eigenvalue is capital lambda, then I'm interested in this, in this uh, the, the limiting free energy as the system size grows, I take the log lambda, divide by capital N and let capital N go to infinity. Here, capital N, remember, is the circumference of the cylinder. So that is the desired uh, quantity here. And, uh, right. And uh, as was mentioned already, I think by Hugo, uh, uh, T has a partial diagonalization into blocks, T sub little n, where little n counts the number of particles. Because there is uh, conservation from row to row of the number of particles, if I start with three particles, the next row will have three particles too, I can, I can uh, diagonal, partially diagonalize the, the big transfer matrix into you know, blocks where on each block, it's just a transfer matrix for 
little m particles, right? So t sub n, t sub little m is a transfer matrix for little n particles and it's, it's, it's smaller, but you know, not hugely smaller. It's n capital N choose little n by capital N choose little n matrix, uh, uh, matrix. So it's still quite, you know, sort of exponentially large matrix. And the, the magic of the beta ansatz is that, you know, we got this enormous matrix, you know, exponential size matrix. How can we possibly uh, uh, study it through linear algebra? Beta ansatz is a way to identify the eigenvectors in some explicit form, right? And uh, for the six vertex model, uh, of which this is a special case, there is a certain formula, uh, which, is, which you can read in Baxter and was originally developed by Beta in a, in a different context uh, for writing down the eigenvectors. But in the five vertex model, uh, that formula simplifies even a little bit farther and they can be written as actual determinants of matrices. So the, eigen, the entries, what I should say is the entries in the eigenvectors are determinants. And uh, I'm just gonna show you what it is for n equals three particles and you can easily generalize for any number of particles. So I suppose we just have three particles uh, per row. And then here's what the eigenvector looks like. It's actually pretty simple. Right? It's a three by three matrix. It's a determinant of a three by three matrix. And the entries are just like, a, it's just, it's kind of like a Vandermann, a generalized Vandermann matrix. In fact, like the, right, the matrices which occur in the numerator of a Schur function, right, what's that formula? Jacobi formula for the Schur function, uh, right? Z1 to the X1, Z1 to the X2, Z1 to the X3, Z2 to the X1, Z2 to the X2, and so on. The only difference is that there's these uh, prefactors here which are just powers of this function a, a of z1, a of z1 squared, a of z1 to the zero here, a of z2, a of z2 squared, and so on. So you know, right? And here a is this very simple uh, function which involves the constants which define the model, little y, little y here is uh, e to the capital Y, and r is our, of course, our constant r per corner. And there's a, z, but there's a z in there, that's the, that's the dependence on z, it's in the denominator. And what are these quantities z, right? So, so just a minute. <laughs> this is a eigenvector. So uh, x1, x2, what are x1, x2, and x3? Those are the positions of the particles, uh, right? So th there's one coordinate here for every triple, every subset of size three of one through n. All right, and what are the zi's here? The zi's are these parameters called beta roots, beta roots. And they are the distinct roots of some, some polynomial equation, which uh, in this general six vertex model, they're quite complicated, but in this, in this five vertex model simple, is significantly simpler. They're the roots of this kind of equation, which we'll discuss uh, uh, shortly. What is this equation? You know, z to the n, a of z to the little m, right? The left-hand side is just some, some, some sort of polynomial in, in z here and the right hand side is a uh, uh, symmetric function in all the, all the z's. So there's, there's little n beta roots. In this, in this case, there's just three of them, z1, z2, z3. There's one for each column. And uh, this, the right hand side of this equation is a symmetric function in all the roots and therefore uh, for the purposes, for, for our initial purposes, we can just think of this as a constant. And then the beta roots are the roots of this simple polynomial equation. All right. Okay, so here we go. Here's the first, I, I'm happy to present this to you, even though it's a little bit technical, it might seem on the surface to be technical because there's a couple of very, very pretty things that go on. So I, I hope you're willing to follow me for a few minutes. So the first thing is that we have this function f, which depends on three coordinates, uh, in which I called x0, x1, and 2, and x2. I called them x1, x2, x3 on the previous slide, but no big, no big deal, sorry. Uh, and the first thing to notice is that this expression, this determinant, has this sort of cyclic symmetry. If I, uh, f of x0, x1, x2 is the same as f of x1, x2, x0 plus n, Right, so if I take the, the guy on the left and I 
uh, translated by n, so this sort of gone once around the cylinder, uh, I get the same value. So this, this is essentially saying that, that ex the expression is, uh, uh, even though the xi's are integers, I can think of them as being in the group z mod nz as, as well, I get, you know, right? Okay, so here's, and here's the proof. If I start with the left-hand side here, f of x1, x2, x0 plus n, right, is this determinant of some three by three matrix. And, I, and rather than write out the three by three matrix, I just wrote out one column because in fact, all the columns are identical to each other except for the different z's. So this is the, right, there's three columns. I, z1 column, z2 column, z3 column. This is the first column, right, looks like this. And, uh, Right, so the, the x naught plus n here uh, is, is this part here. I get zi to the x naught plus n. And I'm going to factor, factor that into this, those two monomials there. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply each column by a of z of i and then divide, divide it out. And so so <laughs> this, this expression is clearly the same as this. I'm just using sort of linearity of the, of the determinant when I multiply all the entries in a given column by a constant. And this, in this case, I'm multiplying the ith constant by a of z of i, and then I'm dividing out front afterwards by the product of the a of z i. So I haven't made any change here. But now, if you look at the-, the There was a question in the, in the group chat about how to understand what it means to solve the beta roots in, in the box. So how, how is this being used to define the z i's? Yeah, let me just, okay, so <laughs> uh, that's a good question. Let me, let me uh, uh, leave that for a moment and come back to that. that. It'll come up again. But for now, let's just assume that the z's satisfy this equation. I haven't told you how to find such z's because it's, it's a kind of a funny uh, consistency, right? Each z has to be a root of this, but then, uh, you know, you need the z's to, to determine the right-hand side anyway. So really what we have is a system of n polynomial equations which you have to simultaneously solve. But uh, okay, never mind. Let me talk about that in, in just a second. Anyway, I got from this, this, this line to this line. Now what do I do? Well, if you, if you, see, if you look down here at this, at this last entry here, a of z i cubed z i to the n, that's exactly the left-hand side of the beta equation. So I can replace that with the right-hand side. And what happens if I replace it with the right-hand side? Well, the right-hand side is, a, is independent of i, right? It's a product over all i's. And, and therefore, I can, if I replace this guy, which depends on, which a priori looks like it depends on i, it actually doesn't depend on i. So I can factor it out completely of the, of the last row of the matrix, right? So now, Instead of factoring, instead of multiplying by a column, I'm going to use the linearity of the, of the determinant with respect to the rows. And I factor that out completely, and I'm left with the zi to the x0 down there. And then there's this, this extra factor, minus 1 to the n plus 1, which allows me to permute the rows back to the original case. Oh, yeah, and when I factor this out, it exactly cancels the prefactor. Right? This, this factor a cubed z to the capital N uh, exactly cancels the product of the a's, which is right here, when I factor it out of each, each, each uh, entry in the bottom row. Did that make any sense? Anybody follow that argument? <laughs> right, so it's all, it's all very, very just simple linearity of the determinant with respect to the columns and with respect to the rows. That's all I used. And also the fact that when I permute the rows, I get some uh, sign here. And if you, if you, once you understand this argument, you can see that, I mean, you, you can believe at least that in the general six vertex model, there's a similar kind of argument. Uh, it's just instead of involving it, doesn't involve a determinant, it involves some, some, something else which is very similar to, similar to a determinant. But it's still a, a anyway. All right, so there's one more step in the, in, I mean, this is, this was, that was just a preliminary lemma here, this sort of cyclic invariance of the, of the expression. Uh, but to prove that it's an eigen, eigenvector, we have to actually, you know, brutally plug it in to the transfer matrix. Here's our, here's our proposed eigenvector. 
I want to apply the transfer matrix and see what happens. And then do the sum, right? Because, uh, okay, so, and I, in retrospect, I did this upside down, so I apologize. So imagine that the, the X's are the uh, final state and I want to sum over all possible Y's. So if you think of the transfer matrix as going down for this example, it'll make more sense. So when I apply the transfer matrix to F and I look at its X1, X2, X3 entry, I want to sum over all states which lead in to X1, X2, and X3, which means I'm going to sum over all possible interlacing uh, configurations, uh, configurations which interlace with the X's. So Y1, sorry, Y1 here runs from X1 plus one all the way up to X2. Right, that's what the first sum, y1 goes from x1 plus one to x2, y2 goes from x2 plus one to x3 and so on. And y3 runs from you know, x3 plus one all the way around the cylinder up to x1, but I'm just gonna make it run from x3 plus one to, the, to x1 plus n. Uh, and by the lemma, that'll be equivalent to having it run all the way around the cylinder. Okay, so that's what I have to evaluate. And I have to somehow show that this this is, uh, I mean, the right-hand side is a multiple of the thing I started with, f, f of x1, x2, x3. And now there's sort of one obvious thing to do, which is, you know, this should be a capital F here. <laughs> Just apply the first sum to the, again, we're gonna use linearity of the determinant. I'm gonna apply the first sum to the first row of the, of the determinant, the second sum to the second row of the determinant, and so on. Right? The, the fact is we have this multiple sum and each term here is a, deter is a big determinant, a three by three determinant in this case. So I've got a triple sum of three by three determinants, but the first sum only changes the first row, the second sum only changes the second row and so on. So I can just put those sums inside the determinant and I do get a determinant of a, of a big matrix, uh, but that matrix, uh, yeah, so that, that's, this is what I get. I just, I just put those, so here you see that Y1 runs from X1 plus one to X2. So uh, if, if Y1 is, let's just do it backwards. Suppose that Y1 is equal to X2, right? Then the con contribution is one times Z1 to the X2. But if Y1 is just left of X2, then <clears throat> I'm gonna get, you know, the, the configuration is gonna have a bend. So I'm gonna get two copies of R and then I get a, a, a little y, which is e to the capital Y. I apologize for using y's for two different reasons, two different ways here, but uh, that's, that, this is e to the capital Y, and I divide by z1 because it's shifted over. So anyway, the, the net effect is that this is just a geometric series up here. Each of these entries here is just a geometric series. Start, and the first geometric series essentially starts from x2 and ends up at x1 or x1 plus 1. I hope that's clear. And so, you know, just sum the geometric series in, in this, in the, you know, simple, simple, simple geometric series sum. And then you can break apart each of these entries now into two, into two uh, parts, one at one endpoint and the other at the other endpoint. And maybe I shouldn't say too much here. By the way, again, I'm just giving you the first column of the matrix. You have to do this three times, but in each case, it's a, it's, a, it's the same calculation, exactly the same calculation, just different indices. Okay, so, so uh, at this point, you, you, know, you group everything together so that, the, so that uh, uh, in the first row, we had a Z1 to the X2, right? And, and then there, there was one term for the, and remember that the first row Y1 is running from X1 plus one to X2. And when I sum the geometric series, I'll have a term near x2 and a term involving z to, z, z to the x2 and a term involving z to the x1. And that's what you see here, z1 to the x2 and a z1 to the x1. And there's some coefficients, which you know, I'm not gonna bother with too much. And then the same thing in the next row and the next row. And, and these a's are just along for the ride up to this point. And, and let's call this, this coefficient b and that coefficient d. And there's a certain number of factors of y uh, which, which, are, which are also there to, just to clog up the works a little bit. All right, so, so now we've arrived at this situation and uh, we can factor out the, all the denominators just for simplicity. I factored out all the denominators of these rational expressions and, oops, 
this is almost the end, right? Two more lines, stick with me. <laughs> we have z1 to the x2, and if I'm the numerator of b, this expression, if I, once I back out the denominator, the numerator of b is exactly a. So we're kind of lucky there. The numerator of b is exactly a, uh, and the, the numerator of d is just r squared. And so what happens is that the, in the first, for the first term in each of these guys, I get an extra factor of a. In the second terms, I get an extra factor of r squared plus some y stuff. This is my new matrix. And here's the last magical step is that this matrix now factors uh, into, a product, into f times another matrix here, uh, a simpler matrix here. This, this make, right? This is this. I'm using vertical lines here because I only care about the determinant. But the determinant of this matrix, because the matrix itself is a product of two matrices, I can just take the product of the determinants of those matrix. One of them is exactly the matrix F, and the other matrix is this sort of less busy looking matrix over here. And this matrix, well, it, unfortunately, it looks like it has some dependence on all the x's and that's bad but when you take the determinant of this matrix you see that all the x's sort of telescope together and and the x the dependence on the little xi's goes away completely right this this matrix has only two uh, non-zero diagonals right it's the diagonal it's the main diagonal and just above the diagonal plus the lower left corner right so when you take that determinant i'm just going to get r to the sixth times y to the n uh, plus an, an extra term here. And this extra term looks like it depends on, on one of the z's, uh, but in fact, if you remember uh, the definition of a, that's a symmetric function in all the z's, so we can just treat it as a constant. Okay, I don't, I don't know, I don't know uh, how that went because it's very hard to judge an audience reaction on Zoom, but uh, I hope that you are at least convinced that uh, you know, the, the, there's nothing, nothing sneaky going on here. It's just some uh, geometric series summation and using linearity of the determinant. That's the end of the proof that, that f is the eigenvector, by the way. That was the, that was the proof that f, that f is an eigenvector. Okay, but we, okay, so now I can move on, right? We did that initial sort of combinatorial step and I can move on and, and study that equation, uh, the equation for the beta roots, right? This is the boxed green equation here that's the equation for the beta roots. And like I said, this is a, you know, a prior, this is some linear, I mean, uh, not, not linear, system of polynomial equations for the Z's, for the Zi's. And in the six vertex model, this is some extreme, you know, very complicated mm, uh, system, which you can't really deal with in, easily. But in the five vertex model, this, they decouple in this nice way. And because the right-hand side is a symmetric function of all the beta roots, all, all little n beta roots, each beta root has to satisfy, it satisfies exactly the same polynomial equation. That the left-hand side, z to the n, a to the, a to the, z to the capital N, a of z to the little n equals constant, right? A priori, we don't know what that constant is, but we can adjust the constant later. Uh, uh, to, to be the correct value. So in fact, it, it's easier if I uh, uh, rescale the roots just for convenience. Let's let w be z divided by these constants, right? Remember little y is just e to the capital Y and r is just our constant r. So those are just constants. I'm just gonna rescale them. And then the, the wi satisfy this very simple looking polynomial equation w to the capital N minus little n, one minus w to the n equals constant. And, and a, priori, a priori, we don't know what this little constant is, but it's gonna end up being some function of all, the, of all our parameters. We can, after we do the calculation, we'll be able to figure out what c is. Right, remember capital N is the system size, it's the circumference of the cylinder, and little n is the number of particles. So for example, uh, you know, if we've got 16 particles, and uh, sorry, we've got cylinder of size 16 and we've got four particles, this is the equation. And if you look at the roots of that equation uh, for various constants, they look, they're illustrated here, right? The, uh, 
the different colors, the green, the blue, and the red, those are three different values of the, of the right-hand side, the constant. And notice how nicely the roots uh, are spread out on these ovals. These ovals are called Cassini ovals, right? The rescaled beta roots lie on some ovals, which are kind of like, you know, logarithmic analogs of ellipses, right? They, the Cassini oval, C A B, C alpha beta is, is a set of complex numbers whose such that the, if you take alpha times the log of the distance to the origin plus beta times the log of the distance to one, you get one. That's the definition of a Cassini oval. And, that, and the Cassini ovals are these, are these curves, the green, the blue, and the red. And the interesting th thing to note here is that uh, uh, when the constant is small enough, the, there's the, the oval really splits up into two, has two components. There's one component which surrounds one and there's another component which surrounds zero. And then as you increase the constant, there's some critical point uh, at which the ovals join together and make a single oval, uh, like you see for the blue one and the green ones. And the roots, the roots of our equation are always sort of nicely spaced points around these Cassini ovals. And, but, but you know, this equation has 16 roots and we only care about the uh, four of them. Which four should we take? Well, if we're looking for the largest eigenvalue of our matrix T, it turns out, I won't tell you why, that we need to take the largest roots. And the, the roots that we care about are the ones which uh, uh, are the uh, largest in modulus, and they, they're the ones which are the, also the rightmost uh, n roots. So you see, for example, and it turns out that the, you know, for small c, those are exactly the roots which are contained on the on the right component here. And, but for large C, they're contained you know, to the right of some curve here. And I've drawn this orange curve, which is the curve which separates the roots we care about, the little n roots from the remaining roots that, that, that we don't care about. If we cared about some other eigenvector, some lower eigenvector, then we would need to deal with these other roots as well. But for the largest, for the leading eigenvector, we just need the rightmost roots. In this case, the rightmost four roots because the four is the number we care about. Rick, is that fact obvious? I guess both that it depends on the right, on the right mo or on the biggest modulus ones and then that those are the rightmost? It, uh, well, it's not immediate, but if you look at the eigenvalue here, which is the product of this matrix, right? You're trying to find the roots to maximize that eigenvalue and with a little small amount of thought, you can see that the, the maximizing the eigenvalue corresponds to maximizing the moduli of the of the roots here and that's that those are the ones on the right and, and the fact that those are the ones on the right just is because they live on this cassini oval and you can show some monotonous well, all the roots live on the cassini oval and there's this natural they see this orange curve which uh, separates the the this little n roots from the capital n minus little n other roots and that curve that curve is yeah i don't know that curve is somehow important, but uh, <laughs> uh, did I answer your question? Yeah, there, there were two other questions. Um, well, okay, maybe read his question. Uh, the intuition, so he's asking, I guess, the intuition is that C scales like a power of N, is that true? Uh, yes, C is like some constant to the capital N power or little n power. We're, interested, we're going to be interested in little n and capital N going to infinity simultaneously so that the ratio tends to some constant. And then C should also be some, some other constant to raise to the capital N power. Right. So if you try to look at this equation when, uh, yeah, okay. And there was another question from Sanjay. Okay. There is a, right, the, the, this, split of the oval into two parts is going to be important. That's an that's a interesting phase transition in the model. But go ahead. There was another question. I probably can't see my uh, chat window. Was there another question? Uh, well, there was this question from Sanjay in the chat. I don't know if, if you see it or I can read it. Is there a way to formalize the equidistribution of the roots? Oh, yeah, of course. Yes. Uh, Right, I, I, I didn't mean to sound vague there. Everything is quite explicit. 
if you uh, uh, if you take the nth power, the nth root of both sides of the equation, right? Then uh, the c, which starts out to be a real number, will will have n n different phases. There's n different nth roots, and for each for each root. For each of those nth roots, there's there's one of these uh, roots here. So so the there's an sort of explicit inverse expression for the values of the roots in terms of points on the unit circle. Let's not get into that kind of detail right now. I can tell you later. Okay, let's move on. Well, uh, yeah. so at this point we can we can. Uh, Define our remember we had this conformal coordinate which I harped on a lot yesterday, right? And if you recall, for lozenge tunnelings, the conformal coordinate uh, uh, was some had this nice sort of geometric interpretation in terms of the angles, in terms of the the angles of this triangle, which were pi s and pi t. Pi, s and t are like the slopes, right? This this model also has an a capital X and a capital Y, and also has some uh, height function associated to it. So it has these slopes, slope variables S and T. And here's the analog uh, in this general case. And let me just, I just drew the picture for R less than one. There's an analogous picture for R bigger than one, which I don't need to give. Uh, so here's the triangle zero, one, Z. Hope you see it here. And now there's this new point along the real axis, one minus R squared, which lies between zero and one. Right, so we can draw this, uh, this, this, this extra line here. And now this, this angle, right, originally it was, for the lozenges, it was pi s. Uh, now it's s, now it's theta times s, where theta is some parameter, which, is, which we'll talk about in a second. And, okay, the other angle here, well, the third, ang third angle up here is pi times one minus s minus t. I put that here, I just sort of flipped the triangle over just for convenience, but uh, so here's, Here's theta times one minus s minus t, and the last angle here doesn't go all the way. It just it just goes between one minus is the angle between this this edge and that edge. So that's t theta. Uh, <laughs> okay, so maybe I should let, let me start over. Uh, if I if you give me a complex number z in the upper half plane, then because I know zero, one, and one minus r squared, I can determine all these quantities t theta, s theta, one minus s minus t theta. And this, this angle here, by the way, is, uh, what is it, pi minus theta. So I can determine theta and therefore I can determine s and t. So that, give, that tells you how to get s and t as a function of z. And, it's, and it, you can, I hope you can see it's kind of a generalization of what happens in lozenges, a, a deformation of what happens in the lozenge case. And the quantities x and y, which in the lozenge case were just the, the exponents of the side lengths, they're more complicated now, uh, but they do, uh, I mean, have quite explicit expressions in terms of z or conformal parameters z. x is, you know, minus log of one minus r squared minus b of z over one minus r squared, where b is this sort of dialogarithm like function here. b of u is, you know, one over pi argue log of absolute value one minus u plus imaginary part of the poly of the dialogarithm of u. Uh, hope that's okay. Some complicated function. Uh, and y is the same thing but uh, with, uh, with z replaced by w bar where w bar is this point here, right? So there's a circle. Uh, if you took a, take a circle around z zero and one minus r squared and draw the line from z to one, it'll intersect the circle at some new point which we call w bar, uh, the conjugate of w, the actual value of w can be obtained from this uh, simple expression here. So W and Z are, you know, comp complex analytically related to each other through this uh, equation here. Okay, so this is kind of a very pretty uh, geometry which extends the geometry which we know and love about lozenges into the, for this five vertex model. But it's a little bit more complicated because we're not just dealing with elementary functions like logarithm, we've got this dialogarithm now down here, this B. Uh, uh, and where does all this stuff come from? Well, you have to analyze the, the eigenvalue here uh, 
using this uh, using these rescaled beta roots, right? We have a reasonably explicit expression for the beta roots. We've got a quite explicit expression for the eigenvalue. And, you know, you plug it in and you do some, you turn some products into integrals in the in the limit, and that's what this that's where these uh, dialogisms come from. Okay, so now we're essentially done because we can, you can, we can, we know what the beta roots are. Uh, we can figure out the eigenvalue with a little bit of analysis, which I'm sparing you. Uh, and I'm just going to plot the formula. And there's, you know, there's an explicit analytic expression for the surface tension, which now depends on R. And it depends on, you know, the free energy depends on X and Y. The, this Legendre dual, as I mentioned, depends on these two parameters, S and T. So it, it also lives in the same triangle because essentially the configuration space is the same. It still has the same set of slopes. And for some reason, I drew, the, drew it upside down because I thought it was easier to see. Uh, but there it is. This is a plot of minus sigma rather than a plot of sigma. This sigma is still a convex function. And then there's something interesting. And now we can see there's something interesting that we didn't see before in the lawson stalin case is that sigma is not completely analytic. It's only piecewise analytic. It's got these two pieces uh, near the diagonal of the triangle. There's a piece where sigma is exactly just a linear function. Uh, just, you know, just this is, this is just a linear function of the, on that region. And then it's a nice curvy analytic function here. So let's call these two regions, the repulsive region where it's strictly convex and the coexistence region where uh, it's linear. And the boundary between these two is not hard to compute as some, some sort of hyperbola there. And if you check, you can check that when R tends to one, this hyperbola goes all the way to the, tri to the, to the, to the diagonal of the triangle. So indeed, in, you recover the correct formula when R goes to one for the, for the lozenge channeling case. There's no coexistence phase. Oh yeah, uh, one, one, one other thing I should mention is I said there's an explicit formula here, but the, it's a, it's, it's, in this case, it's a parameterized surface. It's very, I mean, you can't give an explicit formula for sigma as a function of S and T, you can, but it's a parameterized surface. If you parameterize both S, S, T, and sigma as a function of Z, the conformal coordinate, then everything is explicit using dialog others. And it turns out that the Hessian determinant, remember the Hessian determinant was also an important player uh, in yesterday's talk, is the fourth power of this function theta. And if you recall, last time I said uh, certain, something nice happens if the, Hessian, the fourth root of the Hessian is a harmonic function of z. And so let me go back. And if you look at, here's z, uh, uh, theta is, well, pi minus theta is this angle, which is indeed a harmonic function of z, right? This angle here is just, you know, log of z divided by, you know, this thing here. So anyway, that angle there is a harmonic function of z. So we're in, we're in, in the, exactly the situation which, uh, where things work nicely, the, the Hessian determinant is a fourth power of a harmonic function. Okay, so now, uh, but now with a little bit more work, Okay, so here's the here, here's by the way the free energy. Here's a plot of the free energy. I didn't, you know, again, it you know I can't give an explicit expression for the free energy because it's sort of a parameterized plot, parameterized in terms of z. But you can see that here's the here's the repulsive region in the Newton polygon, and the the amoeba, which the thing I called the amoeba, is over here. It's some subset of the x y plane, which uh, looks like that. All right, uh, and uh, uh, in the case R is bigger than one, remember when R is bigger than one, the paths like to have lots of corners. Then in fact, there's no coexistence phase. The, the surface tension is defined and analytic on the whole triangle. Uh, but there's one interesting feature along the boundary there, uh, which in terms of the free energy means that there's a sort of uh, funny double tentacled uh, uh, region here inside the free energy. Not so important. Here's a let's do a couple, let's look at a couple simulations. This is a, a box plane partition simulation. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the paths in this case are going 
you know, well, north and west rather than north and east, but you know, the paths start here, they wander across and they end up there. The, the, each path here is a, like a contour of the height function. This is for r equals 0.6. And uh, because the, we're in that nice situation uh, where the Hessian determinant is a fourth power of a harmonic function, there is an explicit, ex there's an, a sort of, an explicit sort of algebraic way to find the limit shapes. There's this, this is a Darbu integrable model. So there's an explicit limit shape and here, here it is, right? If you look for the limit shape inside a box plane partition, right? This is an explicit, there, there's the thing, I just drew the level lines of the height function here. And you can see it still has these nice facets near the corners. But uh, here there's again a, a new feature, which we don't see in the Lawson's timely case. If you look, there's a little gap here near the, near the diagonal walls. This elliptical shape here, which is now just piecewise analytic. It's not an ellipse anymore. It's just a piecewise analytic elliptical kind of shape. But, it's, but it doesn't actually touch the corner, that doesn't actually touch the edge there, there's a gap. And uh, we don't actually know what's going on there uh, because the, the slope, when you, when, you get to, when you get to this point, this slope tends to the boundary of our repulsive phase. Remember there's this repulsive phase here. And when the slope gets to a boundary, you, you know, you, you, there, there are no, it gives measures over here. Ergata gives measures here. Every measure here appear, has to be a, some sort of convex combination of measures along the boundary here. So that's why I call it a coexistence space because as far as we understand, uh, there's no limit here. If you, in fact, this, I should show you the other pictures. It's easier to see. Here's, a, here's an even smaller R and here's an R equals 0.25, right? Uh, okay, I'm going too fast. Let me go back. <laughs> Here's what happens when you decrease R. So let's look at our box plane partition again. And here's R equals 0.5, here's R equals 0.35. And what you can see is that this, our, our elliptical shape here, this football shape is getting thinner and thinner. And in fact, it's almost disappeared here at R equals 0.35. And it turns out that when R is one third, less than or equal to one third, this thing goes away completely. And uh, there's this big question mark about what's going on in this outside of that phase. Up here, we have a facet. Here, we don't know what's going on. And if you look at the simulations, as R decreases, there's R equals 0.4. You can vaguely convince yourself that something nice is going on in the middle, but then there's this big sort of stair, stair step cases here. And at, at R equals 0.25, it's much more evident that uh, there's these sort of large scale structures, right, where the, where this, where all the, where you get either all horizontal, sort of a mostly horizontal thing or a mostly vertical thing. And so the sort of conjecture, natural thing to conjecture here is that uh, at a typical, at a point inside here, you're gonna get some convex combination of two ergodic situations. One which is all, one which is mostly vertical and one which is mostly horizontal. And if I did another simulation, you know, this stair step might be, might be shoved over and you would see a vertical thing. Right, so maybe there's no limit shape here and you just see some sort of random set of giant stairs here, which, and between two stairs, you see mostly horizontal or mostly vertical. That's all conjectural. <clears throat> I'm doing question wise. Nobody has a question about that? <laughs> Good. Can I, Rick, can I make a comment? Or I can make it at the end if you want. I don't care. It's up to you. Uh, what, what you've shown looks very similar to uh, these waterfalls in uh, Borodin Gorin uh, rains. I, I can uh, send you a link at the end. Yeah, yeah, I also have them inside the Aztec diamond. Those are so, doing. Those are dimer models, and for the dimer models, you also you always get a you know unique translation invariant give space. So there's no coexistence in dimer models. Uh, right, but pictorially it looks the same. I'm just talking about pictorially, so so I don't know what type of. Uh... No, I don't think I don't think you see this kind of picture. I think in those models you see a single. You always see a single phase, and uh, you know there's always only one phase here, right? 
But this, see this curve here? It looks like it's, you try to draw a curve between those two phases, like it's wandering around randomly. So if I did another simulation with exactly the same parameters, this curve would be doing something else, you know, it would also be, you know, doing something else. And, you, and so you wouldn't be able to, there's no limit shape as far as I understand to this curve. I mean, conjecturally. Whereas in the Lawson's channeling cases, there is an, an, an exact limit shape. And depending on where you are, you see always the same measure. Did that answer your question, Dan? Uh, yeah, but I should also comment, maybe, but I should also comment that those are not uniform measures they're looking at, right? So the measures are inhomogeneous. Yeah, yeah, no. But, but, but I guess what you're saying probably is, uh, is still correct. They're sort of locally periodic. I mean, they're periodic with some large period, but the, in the macroscopic limit, they're, they're, uh, they're well-defined Gibbs measures. Okay. Okay, so, uh, We, want to, we wanted to see to what extent this magic of fourth power of harmonicity uh, was true. And so we uh, uh, ex look for ways to extend the, our, our results on the fiber optics model. And here's, here's what we came up with, which is in, in retrospect, not very, and it's kind of obvious what to do, but we're gonna ch change the models to, to put uh, uh, different weights on all the vertices. So I'm gonna take a periodic sequence uh, along every, uh, uh, periodic se sequence of alphas along the horizontal coordinates and a periodic sequence of betas along the vertical coordinates. And then I'm gonna make a five vertex model now, which has weights uh, uh, R, which, which depend on the vertex you're sitting at. And the weights R are just gonna be the product of the weights A, I, and B, J. So R, I, J is alpha, I, beta, J. And uh, we're going to require that all the RIJs are less than one or they're all bigger than one. Otherwise it doesn't really work. Okay. And for simplicity, let's assume that the alphas form a periodic sequence like, you know, one, two, one, two, one, two. And the betas are also a periodic sequence of some other period. Some, I mean, some, some potentially different period. And in that case, in this case, uh, it's also true that this har harmonic property is still true. And therefore, we can still get the Darboux integrability. We can still get sort of explicit limit shapes. We can do the analytic uh, machinery to compute the free energy, the surface tension, and solve the differential equations which, which result. And, uh, but, uh, and we originally thought that the proof was going to be quite easy. I mean, a quite sort of simple extension of the fiber tricks case. And, uh, it wasn't quite as easy as we thought, uh, but the proof is indeed based on uh, the, I mean, the combinatorial part of the proof is based on some reasonably simple fact, which is the commutation of the transfer matrix, right? I, I discussed the transfer matrix, which goes from one row to another. Uh, in, in a situation like this, the, the transfer matrix, you know, you can certainly, you can still compute the transfer matrix from one row to the next, but now it's going to depend on this parameter beta and, uh, Right. The, what you need to show to make the argument work is that this transfer matrix that which depends on beta is is going to commute with transfer matrix which depend on some other beta. So if I have T of beta one and T of beta two, I want to show that those commute uh, and there, therefore they will have the same eigenvect leading eigenvector, or the, at least the same eigenvectors. And that is the start of the analysis which allows us to compute the surface, the free energy and so on. And so we asked ourselves, you know, why do they commute? Uh, and uh, uh, of course, there's some Yang Baxter equation in the background, like Michael talked about, uh, and I think Hugo also mentioned. But uh, in this case, uh, uh, we just prove that the transfer matrices commute sort of directly without using the Yang Baxter equation. Uh, right, if you, and uh, there's some symmetric polynomial which comes up, kind of like what Ma Michael Wheeler talked about, and it's probably some, I'm sure it's some special case of his Hall Littlewood polynomials, but I'm not exact, I'm not sure, but I mean, 90% sure that it is, <laughs> because I think he was doing the uh, stochastic case, 
And this is, a, this is in the non-stochastic model. Uh, we still get the symmetric polynomials. Rick, I think they are called the growth and dick polynomials. Okay, good. Growth and dick polynomials. I can send you an email afterwards with, with more references. Awesome. Anyway, the, the, there are, it, it's not too hard to show that the, the transfer matrices commute uh, and, uh, you know, there's some family of symmetric polynomials, growth and dick polynomials, according to Dan, uh, associated to them. And here's the, here's the example of the sort of simplest one. This is the only one you need to prove the, prove the commutation. And, and of course, they're, they're symmetric in beta 1 and beta 2. Beta two. They're also symmetric in all the alphas. Uh, do I need to say more here? Let me just say it. Uh, this is kind of a fun little polynomial. Uh, you take the product of one minus, so it's a sum over all k's. Uh, of, a pr of an n-fold product. And the kth term, you take the first k minus, well, you take the first the product from zero to k minus one of one minus a i k, and then the kth term, you just put a k by itself, and then the remaining terms, you put one minus a i y. So the x is at the beginning, and the y's are at the end, except for the kth term where you don't have any x or y, it's just a. And if you sum those up, you find that the result is a symmetric in X and Y. And it's in fact symmetric in all the A's as well. And here's the, here's the case, N, N equals three, you know, A naught, one minus A one Y, one minus A two Y, and then there's the X term, the Y term, and the A one in the middle, and then there's two X ones first, and then the A two. And if you just expand that all out, uh, you, you know, you, here it's sort of obviously symmetric, but you get some, in terms of the A's, all the coefficients are elementary symmetric functions, and the, in terms of the x's, they're the, uh, you know, what are they called? The complete symmetric functions uh, of the appropriate degree with some size. Okay, so uh, then with some work, which I, I'm not gonna tell you, you can compute the free energy of this model from the transfer matrix approach uh, and several Legendre dualities. And here's a, uh, just, just for fun, draw the, do the pictures, right? Here's a picture for a two by two periodic alphas and betas. And uh, uh, it looks a little bit different for our less than one and our bigger than one, but you get this, this interesting curse. Uh, there they are. If you, if you project this to the plane, you, you see the amoeba shape, and you can see that the amoeba shape is starting to get more and more, more complicated as the domain gets larger. Uh, okay, uh, gosh, I thought maybe I'd talk about probabilities, but I probably don't have any time, so maybe I should stop here. Okay, uh, well, maybe people can ask uh, Rick about probabilities if they want, but let's all think. <laughs> Um, we do have, have some time for, for more questions, so people should just unmute themselves. Uh, the, the, Rick, the uh, phase diagram on the bottom right, so has this, is this something that you, you really know the boundary curve for this phase chart? You know, you have a complete description of it or? Oh yeah, if you remember at the, at the, at the during the first lecture, we did the Bershey Karoff curve and then, and then I said, what happens if you have weight r per corner? And I also gave you the, the equation there. It's just some curve involving, it's an algebraic curve involving e to the x and e to the y. But we, was that your question? Well, well so you, you're, you're giving a picture here, presumably in, in the coordinates of the average number of verticals and horizontals of the phase diagram. Or, or, or maybe not, sorry, not, not that, in terms of the external field. Parameters, I guess. That's right. This is the in the x y plane. <coughs> if, x, if x and y are very small, then uh, you just you don't have any paths at all. Right. And if x and y are very large, then uh, if they're equal, if they're close to equal to each other, then you get this uh, zigzag path, this sort of fully packed zigzag path configuration. It's just one configuration kind of freezes there. Mm -hmm. If x is significantly large, if, if x and y are large, but x is large, or sorry. If X is large and Y is not particularly large, then you get the, the all vertical and likewise for the all, all but uh, if Y is large. 
And so if, I, my question is just whether the, the bounding curve between this is you know, explicit. Oh yeah, yeah, that's a, each of these boundary curves uh, is an explicit algebraic, it's, but it's an algebraic curve in e to the x and e to the y. I mean, back, I could probably, uh, where was that curve? Right, right here. So how does it, you're, you're saying it relates to the, this sort of cutoff or Shakarov. Why is it that it relates to that? Yeah, that was, that was Fabio's question on like day one. <laughs> how do I know? Why is that the boundary curve is related to the Virchik Karoff curve? Well, no, 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 but that's not my question. My question is why is the, in this XY space, which is parameterizing the Gibbs measures, why is the boundary between frozen and unfrozen Gibbs measures given by the same curve that you get from this cutoff Virchik Karoff? Yeah, that's, 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 you know, equivalent to Fabio's question, I think. Yes. Uh, and, if, right, if you, if you go back to the picture, Right, I don't have a very good picture, but that right. My my argument the other day was that that last oh. Uh, well, but this is not with the R. This this picture is the right the, by the wolf wolf shaped theorem. Uh, the graph of the free energy is the limit shape for a fixed for a volume constraint. Mm -hmm. so this picture here, uh, and also the pictures, all those pictures I had for the free energy down at the bottom, they are the analogs of the 3D partition limit shape, uh, if you, at least if you choose the appropriate boundary conditions here. Mm -hmm. okay. so, right, and therefore, you know, if, if I take a 3D, 3D partition of N for large N, and I give it a weight R per corner, and with these staggered weights, if you like, then it will look like this, uh, plus some plus, you know, it'll slowly f f fade away to the to the corners of the of the room uh, far away. And is it it should be the case that when R goes to one, the outside faces go go from six to three, right? So right now you have six outside faces outside the amoeba. These uh, that's right. These six pro sort of frozen phases. Phases. And when R is equal to one, they just collapse into three frozen phases. Uh, that's right. Uh, well, uh, th there is a staggered version of the Daimler model where you get a similar, where you get a similar staggered, uh, I mean, you get a similar kind of amoeba, which has several tentacles. Ah, and then you have some sort of semi-frozen or frozen in uh, some alternate. Exactly. Then these, these phases would be called semi-frozen. I mean, these, these, phrases, these phases here, I, I would call semi-frozen anyway, because they're the exact analog of semi-frozen phases in the Daimler model. This phase does not exist in the Daimler model. This, uh, it, it, uh, as, if you try to make this in the Daimler model, it'll just collapse and, and disappear, this sort of staggered phase. This phase is the one that's due to having uh, R, you know, this large R per corner so this picture is with x and y not equal to zero, right? It's with the uh, x and y. X and y are the coordinates in this picture, right? This is the xy plane. This picture is in the xy plane. So when x uh, and y no, no, I mean in your weights. Ah, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I got confused. So there is a question. Another question in the chat from Pavel Belov. So, so if I may, uh, could I also ask a question? Oh, hey, Reda. Maybe, maybe let's let Rick address the question in the chat first. Sure. Weights of the last two vertices. Is this a, is 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 this a simplification? Uh, yeah, that uh, technically that's a simplification because you can choose uh, right. Uh, but when you go to the limit shape, that it doesn't really matter, right? In, if you have a sort of a large scale limit shape, uh, the you know for every time you turn right, you also you you immediately, I mean, every right turn can be paired with every left turn. So this, essentially the number of left turns and right turns is equal up to, up to some lower order correction near the boundary. 
uh, I mean, due to boundary constraints. And therefore, it doesn't hurt to set, them, set the two equal to each other. If you're dealing with a finite region, then you can arrange boundary conditions so that the number of left turns is not equal to the number of right turns, and then the, these, these, this difference will matter. Well, there's some other parts of the question, but maybe, Reda, what, what was your question? So, uh, so, so in fact, I'm very curious about this GFF uh, fluctuations, like this Gaussian uh, thing. And in the fermionic case, so, it, so like this Gaussianity is built in uh, the, uh, so the algebra. It's like because, well, you always have this Fox space and also, I mean, because also because of the Cauchy's like identity, it's like this, like this is basically it's like some built-in uh, Gaussianity uh, in the limit. But in this case, so is there any hint uh, that at the level of the algorithm that there should be some Gaussianity that is built in, or is that there's no hope? No, I think that I think that you can uh, for models like this. It's, it's I don't think anybody has done it, you know, in complete rigor. But it's not hard to convince yourself that it has to be Gaussian in the limit. The question is, which Gaussian feel is it? And there, the, the, you know, the Gaussian field, like I said, depends on the, the conformal parameter and also the Hessian determinant. Would you have a reference uh, for, for these uh, people who made it like in a non-rigorous way? I, I, can, I can, yeah, there's some phys physics uh, uh, papers of that type. I can try to uh, okay. see you if you want. So Just I'll email you. Send me email, yeah. Thanks. Okay, uh, it looks like Estevan responded to the rest of the question. Um, uh, any other questions for Rick? Okay. Well, so if not, you know, we will finish basically on time. Uh, and uh, I want to thank Rick and, of course, all of the other speakers, but especially Rick for this last very, very nice give talk. A, so. Give a hand to the organizers here. Maybe we can all do that. All right, well, thank you all. It's a shame we weren't in uh, Oxford together. I don't know what the weather's like there right now, but... Um, heat wave. Oh, heat wave. Okay. Uh, uh, all over uh, Europe at the moment. It's yeah. really... <laughs> it's hot here, too. Anyway, um, very glad everyone participated, and uh, hopefully at some point we'll see each other again. Right, until then. Bye. Okay, goodbye. Take care.